prophet. Not only does he tell us the truth, he is the truth. He's the embodiment of the very thought of God. He's the word incarnate. He's a prophet. Never lead you astray. Never lead you into error. He is the truth. But he's also a priest. And as a priest, he doesn't just offer a sacrifice. He becomes the sacrifice himself. Once for all. Never again. He's also a king. But he's not just a king. He is the king of all kings. Sovereign Lord of the universe. That's a great redeemer to have, isn't it? If you have that by faith, you are in good, good hands. Let's go to Romans chapter 15. Verses 1 through 7. Paul's words to the Roman church. Hear the word of God. Now we who are strong ought to bear the weaknesses of those without strength, and not just please ourselves. Each of us is to please his neighbor for his good and to his edification. For even Christ did not, did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction, so that through perseverance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Now may the God who gives perseverance and encouragement grant you to be of the same mind with one another according to Christ Jesus, so that with one accord you may with one voice glorify the God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, accept one another just as Christ also accepted us to the glory of God. That's the word of God today. Let's pray. Help us, Lord, today to understand what it means to receive one another as you've received us to the glory of your Father, Lord Jesus. We pray in your name. Amen. I want to introduce you to somebody who I mentioned last week. His name is Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He is a German who lived during the Nazi regime when Hitler was running his uh, nightmare through Europe. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a Christian. He was a pastor. And as a pastor, he found himself in a very peculiar position as a German who wanted to love his country, but as a German who did not love what was happening around him. He uh, wrote a book, gave it to the church, and in that book uh, called uh, The Cost of Discipleship, he coined a phrase, which I'm not sure he coined it, but it's certainly become very popular because of him, the word cheap grace. Cheap grace. Where I just receive forgiveness and then do my own thing as if God and Christ are no longer the value of my life. In that book he uses this phrase, when Christ calls a man to himself or woman to himself, he bids them to come and die. It's a heavy gospel, isn't it? It's just not about receiving forgiveness and then going on my merry way thinking, good, i got a free ticket to heaven now. No, it's about knowing him. He wrote another book. It's called Life Together. When he was going to check out what pacifism means in the life of Gandhi, not that he wanted to follow Gandhi, but he just had some questions, he received a, 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 a communication to become the professor of an illegal seminary uh, in Feikendale in Germany, where the confessing church was gathering theologians to come teach students the word of God, contrary to the wishes of you know, Sir Hitler there. And so he gathered together 25 people, students and professors, in a makeshift house. And during their time together, the 25 of them inspired the book called Life Together. I would like it to, I almost want to make this book requirement for church membership. It's that good. Some of the earlier chapters are phenomenal, and the closing chapter will blow your, your feet away. Just wonderful. Um, but think of it for a second. Life Together. Not just going to church. A lot of us just go to church, right? And then we go home, and that's kind of it. We go to church. That's not God's vision or Christ's vision of the church. Life together in Christ is the vision of the church. That we do life together. When we go through difficult times, we do it together. When we don't agree on everything perfectly, we still do life together. 
When we're not sure about what the future may hold for our body of Christ, we still do life together. That is the vision of what Bonhoeffer believed the scripture teaches in regard to what does it mean to be a community of God's people. He warned very much in his book on several fronts what destroys heavenly community. He says when human community infiltrates the heavenly community of God's people, something is lost and destroyed. One thing he said that could drive human community is when we actually become personality-driven rather than Jesus-driven. Listen to what he says. Here is where the humanly strong person is in his element in this human community, securing for himself the admiration, the love, and the fear of the weak. Here, human ties, suggestions, and human bonds, they're everything, not spiritual ones. And the immediate community of the souls who have reflected that distorted image of everything that is originally and solely peculiar to the community mediated through Christ. Thus, there is such a thing as human absorption. It appears in all the forms of conversions wherever the superior power of one person is consciously or unconsciously misused to influence profoundly and draw into his spell other individuals or a whole community. That's dangerous. When we become so personality-driven that we lose sight of Christ who is all in all. Christ who is the endless ocean of life and grace and mercy. The endless cup to sip from We forget him and we follow an individual. And we become individual driven, but we don't become Christ driven. Bonhoeffer was concerned for the heavenly community of life together. Paul is also concerned about that in Romans 15, where he used those words of unity over and over again, that we serve one another, that we glorify with one voice together who is Christ, that we receive one another as Christ has received us. And Romans is a great book. Oh, It speaks about every person's need for a righteousness that's not their own. Because all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, there is no not one. None righteous. But a righteousness has been revealed from heaven, witnessed by the Bible and the prophets. The righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ alone. And Abraham found it. He believed. He just believed. And it was accounted to him for righteousness. What he didn't have on his own. What you and I don't have on our own. He believed. And then Paul goes on to say that therefore, having been justified by faith, we as his people, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And now there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. None. Absolutely none. I bet you did this this week, Christian. I bet you condemned yourself, didn't you? Probably. That sin that so easily entangles you, you eternally damned yourself again, didn't you? You said, oh, what is wrong with me? That's the joy of Christ. Now there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. None. None whatsoever. It doesn't excuse us. But it should motivate us to continue walking and pursuing him. Paul takes all those truths and says, when we get to chapter 15, we need to make sure we're making a heavenly community. Look at verse 7. Introduce you to a word. Therefore, accept one another, in a little phrase here in English, just as. It's the word kathos. In other words, as he did, so should we. What he's done for us, we should do for one another. That's the heavenly community. That's what Christian church is supposed to be all about. Paul's assuming that there's some differences here. In chapter 14, there's people who believe that no meat is unclean because there's no such thing really as an idol. 
There's some people who believe that drinking wine is okay and some people who don't think it's okay. So there's going to be differences in the body. People are going to be further along on the Christian walk than other people. Some are new, some are old. Some have come to Christ in their late years. Some came to Christ in their younger years. There's going to be differences. But how do we deal with the differences that exist in the body of Christ? Well, we show each other grace. As Christ has showed us grace, so also we should show grace to one another. Our doctrine this morning is this. The people of Christ are to reflect the gospel of Christ to the members who make up the body of Christ. We really are. Just as he, so should we. First of all, in Christ alone. Verse 5. Everything that God gives us in verse 5 of encouragement and in perseverance to be of the same mind is according to Christ Jesus. Period. That's it. Nothing outside of Christ. God cannot and he will not approach his people but through Christ Jesus. He cannot come to a sinner apart from Christ. If God was to come to us apart from his blessed son, his white hot glory, his white hot burning blazing delight in his own being would consume us in a moment. He comes to us only in Christ, only through him. If that is how God approaches his people, then we should approach one another in our interactions only through Christ. Before you're my brother and my sister, you belong to him. You're his possession by faith. You're the king's son's own possession. From a different angle, you're called his bride. You are the unique possession of the God of glory who spoke when the universes came into being. You're his possession. You belong to him. And if I really believe that you belong to him in that fashion and that he loves you like his own, wouldn't that change the way I would treat you in the body of Christ? It should. It better if you're really his possession because God does not deal with us but only through Christ. And so as I approach you and as I interact with you, my brothers, you're first and foremost, you're his. You're not mine. You're his and then you become my brother and sister. That's what Paul's trying to tell us. As he has received you, so receive one another. In the body of Christ, we've got to be careful. The body is not first and primarily here for me. In, 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 the, in the reality of community of life in, in, in the church, we have both fuelers and drainers. Drainers are people who have to have the whole world wrap around their little universe. Their drama has to be everybody else's drama. Their sickness is the only sickness. Their desires are the only desires. Their thing is the only thing. And what happens when that comes into the community of God's people? Is there more than one person here? Well, of course there is. There are fuelers and there are drainers. Now, I understand that people have legitimate needs. What I love about people who have legitimate needs are those who have real needs and who still serve the body of Christ. It's not all about them. Because this morning, represented in this body, there are people who are hurting. Correct? Correct? You can just nod your head. Yes, there are. They have legitimate pains and hurts. But that hasn't stopped some of them from serving. You know, we all have that, that one family member. When they call on the phone, you're like, oh. I haven't heard from Uncle Joe in a while. And every time Uncle Joe calls, what's it about? I need something. You know it. You see, the, it comes on the dial thing, Uncle Joe. And like, what do you do? You don't answer. Because you know exactly what's going to happen. Uncle Joe now needs something. That's not how it's supposed to work in the body of Christ. Everybody serves and plays wounded. Because we all have our wounds. And some of them are mighty, mighty deep. But in Christ, together, as he has received us, we receive one another. We come to him first and foremost through Christ. Paul was sending Timothy to Thessalonica. You know, Timothy had a stomach problem. 
I don't want to offend anybody, but Paul's instruction was, Timothy, take a little bit of wine for your stomach. And that's what he told him to do. And uh, so he's sending Timothy to Thessalonica, not so Timothy can get his self-esteem back up again, so he can help the Thessalonian church. Not because Timothy's a little timid and quiet, because you need to bring life to that church, Timothy. You need to serve them. So first and foremost, in Christ alone, as we interact with one another, we are first and foremost, we belong to Christ, right? We are first his. And that should, in, that should influence how we talk about one another, how we interrelate to one another, that we belong to the king of kings. We're his kid. And if you're his kid, I better treat you like you're his kid. And then you're my brother and sister. Because brother and sister sometimes fight, don't they? Yes, they do. But you're first his kid. Secondly, in loving grace foremost. Verse 15 and verse 2. There's differences in the body of Christ. C uses the word strong. Some are weak. Some have strength. Some don't have as much strength. Verse 2. How do we approach that? Well, let's make sure we do things for their good and for their edification. Let's make sure that our approach to people and our interaction in the body of Christ is for the good of other people. Grace for most. God did not tell me, Steve, when you finally get your act together and you finally stop sinning, then you can come to me and then I'll forgive you. That wasn't the gospel call, was it? Steve, when you finally get shiny enough, when you start finally not doing these things, then you come to me and then you'll be forgiven. That's not the gospel. The gospel is just as I am, without one plea, that that thy blood was shed for me. I just come the way I am, and I let God do the rest. I come to him just as I am, but he's not going to leave me as I am. But I come in that fashion, just the way I am. Would you please receive one another as Christ has received you? We're going to be different people. We're going to have different strengths and weaknesses. I know you think I'm Superman, right? Just raise your hand. You probably don't. This one. Thank you. Thank you, Pete. You now can become a member. I'm just teasing. <laughs> I'm not Superman. We all have our strengths and weaknesses. And that's why we fill up the body of Christ together. We fit like a glove. That's the way it's supposed to work. But it only works if we're giving grace foremost. As he received us, so we receive one another. Grandson illustration. He's two now. Sometimes he drools. Sometimes he drools after eating chocolate. And then he runs up to me and wants to hug. What do you do as a grandparent? Nope. I got the Armani on, pal. Get cleaned up first. No, you hug him. You don't care about those things. You just embrace. That's the same way that Christ embraced you and I. And it's so important not to get into this mode of thinking where we have to really correct everybody about everything. You know, that everything is hyper-corrected. Huh, that drives you nuts, doesn't it? Who wants to be hyper-corrected? Raise your hand. I'm going to follow you around this week. I'm going to volunteer. I'm going to say everything you're doing wrong in your ear. Even the things that you might not be doing wrong, I'll just make stuff up. Who wants that? Is that the Holy Spirit? Is that what it does to you all day long? No. So as we have been received by Christ, let us receive one another. There is time. There is time for godly correction. But that's what we're here for, to help one another. To, to mold and to make each other more like Christ. But a hyper, obsessive, guilt-driven, self-promoting correction, that's not how we received the Lord Jesus Christ. Look what Paul says in chapter 14. Just before this, this chapter, he says in verse 16, Therefore... Do not let what is for your good, a good thing, be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, you know, whether I eat meat offered to idols or drink wine or don't drink wine, that's not the issue, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. For he who is in this way serves Christ is acceptable to God and to approve by men. So then we pursue the things which make for peace and the building up of one another. That's what we're supposed to be doing. So even though we're different, and some of us may have different convictions about certain things in the gray areas, that does not mean we use these things against one another. Yes, there are guardrails that we, that we run through and that we run within, but 
We receive one another just as Christ has received us. I've been selling books on eBay for almost 20 years now. There is this guy. I'm not kidding. He's on eBay. He really is. He never leaves positive feedback for sellers. Never. Never has a a word of positive things to say for anybody. But if there's one little thing wrong with the book you sell him, it's just this blatant red negative feedback on your seller's account, which ruins your reputation, you know, on eBay. So, me being the... me, (laughs) I wanted to see who this guy was. Because I sold him books before. He's never had a problem with my books. So I went online to find out who he was. Sellers on eBay said this about him. This guy is a pain in the neck. He is so unreasonable, someone said. This guy should be off eBay altogether. He gives negative feedback like he's giving out candy. You know what he does for a living? He's a pastor. Can you believe it? He's a pastor psychologist, and his wife writes wonderful books for children. You think, what in the world? We receive one another as Christ has received us. We're not on this hyper-corrective you know, road where we're finding everything wrong with everybody and everything. That's not the life together. That is not the community of Christ. Thirdly, in spirit-filled freedom. I love what he says in verse 4. Through the encouragement of of the scriptures, that we might have hope. I need hope. I don't know about you. I need not just hope for tomorrow. I want my hope to go into eternity. I want to be sure that what I believe is the truth. And it is what is real. And Paul says, through the scriptures, we get this hope. We get this encouragement. God does not approach us with his law. If he approached us with his law, we would be undone because no one can keep it. He approaches us with his son who has fulfilled the law and that's the good news of the gospel. That's what he's brought to us so we can taste life. God has called me to himself through Christ and Christ alone. That's what Paul's been talking about. Receiving each other even though there might be differences. Now, Not all of us have walked with Christ as long as others, correct? So think of the Christian journey as a highway. And it's a several multi-laned highway. But the highway does have guardrails. The guardrails of truth. The guardrails of truth both in what we believe and how we behave. But on that highway, not everybody is on the same mile marker, are they? No, of course not. Not everybody is in the same lane, though some of us might be at the same mile marker. Some of us be 30-year Christians or 40-year Christians or maybe one-year Christians or one-month Christians. But we're not on on the same path. Remember where you came from, Christian. Let's not make more hoops for people to jump through than the gospel itself. Sometimes we make the mistake as mature believers that we think that everybody has to be instantaneously as far as we are in the Christian walk. When I came to Jesus, you know how much I knew? About that much. This is what I knew when I became a Christian. I knew that I was a sinner. And I just didn't say that with um, sort of, I know I'm a sinner. No, I felt it deeply within my soul. So I knew I needed a savior. I had to have someone to save me because without me being saved, I was destined for eternal hell, separation from God. I knew that. And I knew that Jesus had paid the price for sin. That's all I knew. I knew John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That said, whoever believeth him would not perish but have everlasting life. I knew that. That's all I knew. And that was enough to get in. That's the door. Now granted, you become more mature as you walk with the Lord. But let's not make the door so hard to get through. Let's not make the door so narrow that people can't get in. Before they become a Christian. Are you a confessionalist? What is that? Are you an impassable list? What is that? Do you hold to the first or second line of confession? Are you a Calvinist? Which points to you? Is that the doorway? No. The doorway is the gospel of Christ. As he received us, so we receive him. May it first of all be a spirit of freedom. And 
as we grow together as a body of Christ, let God be sovereign. Let's not have the cookie-cutter version of what we think maturity might look like for everybody, and then you have to be like me. You're going to look like I do things. No. We're all on the road growing in Christ, and God sovereignly works in one this and one another. We have strength. We have weaknesses. Some are on the mile marker 400. Some are on mile marker number one. Some are in the third lane. Some are in the fourth lane. Who's in the first lane? Okay. Who feels like they're in the breakdown lane? <laughs> Sometimes that's me, but it's still a lane, isn't it? I mean, maybe we're moving a little slow and we got a flat tire or two, but we do it together. And he says that over and over again. We do it with one voice, verse 6, to the glory of God. That's how we do these things. Um, so we do it with spirit-filled freedom. And it's not freedom to do what I want. It's freedom to be what God has called me to be in his word. And I pray that you sense about your life that as you've believed in Christ or you've confessed Christ, that you are now growing in Christ and that you're maturing in him because that'll be the sign that you are truly one of his. It's not freedom to do what you want, how you want, when you want. It's the freedom to do what you ought to do in Christ. Remember Bonhoeffer, when Christ bids a man to come, he bids him to come and die. Die to self and find new life in him. Final point this morning. In hopeful perseverance. Verse 5. Or verse 4. Paul, he, he repeats these ideas of perseverance and encouragement. And he says, now may the God who gives perseverance and encouragement grant you people, plural, to be of the same mind. So you're doing this together in the same way with one another according to Christ Jesus. The God who gives encouragement. Does God give encouragement? I thought God was up there with a baseball bat, waiting to pounce on us every time we misstep sometime. No, he's the God who gives encouragement. Be, a, be a, someone of an encouraging spirit because you're going to have to persevere. It's going to be hard sometimes. Faith is not easy. When life throws you a curveball and you used to believe in God and Jesus, what happens sometimes? You, you think, was this real? So you're going to have to persevere sometimes. It's going to be hard. Men's Bible study on Wednesday night. Van Gogh, painter Van Gogh, was looking at a painting of a depiction of a, a part of John Bunyan's uh, Pilgrim's Progress. In the painting, it's a, a young traveler speaking with a woman, and he's looking up at the hill, and the, and the place of glory and light, the city of, of light, is way, way up on a mountaintop. And so Van Gogh interprets the painting. And this is how the interpretation went, according to the article. The man in the painting asks the woman, is it uphill all the way? And Van Gogh, the, the lady in the painting says, yes, it's uphill all the way. It, you're going to need to persevere. Well, well, how long will it take to get there? You're going to start in the morning, and it's going to take all day long until midnight. That was Van Gogh's understanding of the journey. That's why I need perseverance and I need encouragement along the journey because it gets really, really, really hard. Um, people sometimes need an encouragement. They may not be always what we think they should be at any given moment, but they should get encouragement and perseverance from the Word who is from God, from the people of God, if we accept one another as Christ has accepted us. Um, I can remember being a young man. So if you're a teenager, if you're in college, great that my time was a little long ago. Um, but I was really lost. I can remember being really lost as a 17, 18 year old. I mean, I was really lost. Not just spiritually speaking, but I didn't know who I was. And I let the world tell me what I was supposed to be. That meant my peers. So whatever my peers said was the thing to do, that's what I did. I just wasn't thinking. I wasn't considering the things of God in Christ, reality, and eternity. I was ignoring those things. They were, I was indifferent to them. I wasn't pursuing. So the world had its way with me. I'm so glad I had two godly parents. I'm telling you. They stuck, it, I stuck with me thick and thin. I had gone to two different colleges. This, that was the beginning of my college journey. And while my parents were going to look at another college for me in Alabama, what was I doing back home? I was having a house party. Now, how do you clean up after a house party when your mother's a cleaning fanatic? 
And you think you can do it well enough so she can't find out what you did. And so sure enough, I'm, I'm telling you, within moments of being home, she noticed her favorite dish towel was missing. Her dish towel. I don't care about dish towels as a 17, 18 year old kid. What do I care? But she noticed. My parents never, never quit on me as their kid. They, they, they showed me the path. They certainly were not, they were not softies. But through their influence, well, I am what I am today. Um, where God used their influence in my life to bring me to a place because of that idea of perseverance and encouragement that God can bring. You know, we even have in the Bible, we have the reality of church discipline, don't we? Even in 1 Corinthians, when it says that Paul says, I give him over to Satan, if you read 2 Corinthians chapter something or other at the beginning, up to 8 maybe, Paul says this, or maybe it's 2 Corinthians chapter 2. He says, sufficient enough is the infliction upon him which was given by the whole. Receive him back now. He's, he's repented. Give hope. Give perseverance. No one is ever out of the reaches of grace. Nobody. George Mueller from Sunday School. He was a liar. He was a drunkard. He was a thief at age 14. He, he had nothing going for him whatsoever. You would have said, that guy, forget him. He's done with. He attends a Bible study at age 19. Some insignificant, out-of-the-way group of a handful of people who are opening up the Bible. And Mueller's heart is open to the Christ of Scripture. Do you know that that man was instrumental in preaching the gospel to over a million people in his lifetime? Do you know that under his care, over 10,000 orphans were granted food and a home and the word of God? Do you know at his funeral in England, there were over 10,000 people there? This 14-year-old kid who was a liar, a drunk, who used to steal from his father and from his father's uh, people who would come in for business, he was terrible. But through perseverance and encouragement, he came to Christ. No one's outside of hope. Nobody. The Apostle Paul, what's he doing? He's killing Christians. He's saying, yep, get rid of those ones, that one back there, you're dead, you're dead, you're out of here too. And uh, what does God do? He steps into his life and he opens his eyes to the truth. Well, for Paul's vision of community, we are to receive one another as Christ has received us. Not with a critical spirit or an overcorrective spirit, that's pathic in nature. We are to receive one another just as Christ has received us. Yes, there are time for godly correction and instruction and exhortation in the word. Of course there is. But may it always be from a heart that is in touch with the amazing grace of Christ Jesus the Lord. One last story and we'll pray. And we'll sing a hymn that we probably don't know. Well, we'll try to sing it at least. I got a picture. I hate to use my grandson again. Our dog died, so... I have to use my grandson now. Sorry, Colin. <laughs> You're taking the dog's place. Um, my daughter took a picture of my grandson during the fall time. And he's up in Maine, and it's during the fall season. And he's standing literally in a sea of fallen leaves on the ground. I mean, there are thousands upon thousands. It's an amazing picture. And there's this little kid sort of in the middle of the picture, not really big, but kind of off in the distance. And he's standing there in this, in this sea of leaves, and the sun is coming through the trees a little bit, and it's shining right on him. It's an amazing picture. It's in my office. You want to see it after service. Glad to take you on a tour. Um, and he's standing there, and he's got one little leaf in his hand. Both hands on it, looking at it like this. Like it was the greatest miracle in the world. When there's thousands all over the ground, but he's just got one of them. And he's looking at it like this is amazing. I think we've lost that sort of awe in the church of Christ when it comes to Christ. All those spiritual blessings, he's just looking at one of them. I pray that's your heart this morning, that every spiritual blessing in Jesus is precious beyond measure to your heart. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the word and uh, help us to understand what is written here. And may we receive one another as you have received us. Through Christ Jesus, um, we love you and ask for your help now in Jesus' name. Amen. All right.